this is a reminder for all of you listening that you need to have a Loctite explanation. Has your time just gone up exponentially on getting in front of customers and walking them through this process so that they deeply understand it? If you are in title, insurance, mortgage, or certainly a real estate sales professional, you are doing yourself and your clients a disservice if you're not getting educated each and every single day. This is the Knowledge Brokers Podcast. I am, again, not Tom Tool. I am Byron Lazine alongside Lisa Chinati as Tom Tool continues to take day after day off and probably just working on his scripting, his positioning, to the market as things are changing. Gonna, Lisa. Wait, I'm going to defend our friend Tommy. Of course you are. Minute because I do believe it is a Thursday afternoon at 4.30. And the reason that we moved it is uh, maybe your schedule didn't accommodate the normal spot on Friday morning at 10 a.m. That's true. But Tom also couldn't do Thursday or Friday. So I will not let you fully defend him. He has given us his word. He'll be back next week. We're all looking forward to having Tom back. But Lisa, I think we can carry the water here a little bit today. Thanks for joining us. And I'll, we're going to go a little different style on this pod. This is going to be very unique from any other Knowledge Brokers podcast. But if you're a real estate professional, this may be one of the most enlightening pods of what the perception of the proposed NAR settlement, what they perceive it to be. We're going to react to two clips from other podcasts. These podcasts are both in the millions and millions of whether views and downloads when you quantify YouTube, Apple, and Spotify together. They're enormous audiences, always on the top of the respective charts for overall podcasts across the country. The first clip we're going to be listening to are four really educated people, uh, very wealthy, three billionaires and a multi-millionaire. You have David Sachs on this podcast, who is a uh, former PayPal mafia guy. So he's wor he works with Elon Musk. You, you've got Chamath, who was one of the first people in at Facebook. These are sophisticated minds who, you know, deal in a, um, in a world where people are buying and selling real estate Often their friends, their network have multiple homes. So we're going to listen to their reaction as they covered this on their podcast. We're going to react to that. Then we'll listen to another podcast and we'll react to that one. So Lisa, I've actually heard both of these clips. You haven't. Nope. Um, we're both going to take notes while we're listening, while we're listening and then, you know, give you our react where where did they get it wrong, Lisa? Where where do they might have some some feelings that we should have empathy for? Um, remember, as real estate professionals, we want to put ourselves in a position to educate, not defend. Yep. Right. And so, if this is the perception out there, and or the perception that millions of people have heard in the last week, just based on how lar large their audience is, we probably should understand this. So let's jump into the clip. And have a listen. All right, we covered that huge NAR lawsuit back in December, and there has been a settlement. Big news for the National Association of Realtors. They've agreed to pay $418 million in a settlement last week, and a federal jury found that the NAR and several large real estate brokerages conspired to artificially inflate agent commissions. The settlement is pretty pretty big deal. People are freaking out about it. As you know, the seller of a home pays the buyer's agent's commission. So you have a buyer and a seller, 6% fee typically, sometimes it's five, but they split that 3% to the buyer and the seller, but the seller is paying that 3% to the buyer. Now that can't be listed in the MLS anymore, and that deal cannot be done ahead of time. Buyers are responsible for paying their agent's commissions going forward. So if you bought a million dollar house, and you were the buyer, you would pay 30000 to your buyer's agent, or you would choose to not have an agent, or you would choose to negotiate it. And you have to have a signed contract. This is a crazy, just shocking shock to the system, according to most people who are in it. I've seen a lot of real estate 
folks who are saying this is going to be healthy because you have this you have to have this conversation between the buyer's agent and the buyer but commissions in the United States are 100 billion dollars a year and one analyst projected the lawsuit would lead to a 30% reduction in commission payments and that would eliminate about half of the 1.6 million active NRA members from the industry. You had a lot of feelings on this, Friedberg, when we talked about it a couple of months ago. What are your thoughts on this settlement? Is anything going to change? Is this as groundbreaking and shocking as people seem to think it is? Well, I would take this settlement along with a lot of the developments and advances in AI as being a moment of catalyzing real change in the residential real estate agency industry. It's an industry that's been known to have fixed pricing and be very expensive to consumers, a real tax on the system. And it's largely been wrapped around this idea of mitigating your liability, reducing risk, servicing the customer. Many of those aspects over the last couple of years have been largely standardized through forms, digitized because so much of this information is no longer going to get paperwork from the courthouse, but a lot of the information sits digitally and can be accessed in a democratized way. And the fact that so much of the service and discovery, reading through documents, understanding what they mean and what they say can be automated through AI and LLMs. Much of this is kind of coalescing around what I hope and expect will be a more seamless, automated direct marketplace for consumers. The challenge is that most consumers put most of their personal net worth into their home. And so it is where most people's net worth is tied up. And so because it is such a sensitive investment and it is their entire savings, they want to have a trusted advisor by them. So it's going to take some time before that trusted advisor becomes some piece of software. But I do think that software is going to play more and more of a role in providing advisory tools and services to consumers in this transaction marketplace. And that's only going to catalyze and accelerate the fee reduction. I do project and I do expect that much of what is charged on a commission basis on a percent of home value today will change to being a fixed fee and a flat so 5K, fee basis. 10K for your buyer's agent. Different services. Agree. So you can have yeah. someone do a la carte. Do the disclosure diligence for me for 5K. You know, negotiate the purchase for me for 10K. And you as a consumer will start to pick from a, a menu of the services that you want to have rendered for you and things that you're comfortable doing yourself. I don't need someone to negotiate price. I don't need someone to find me a home. I've got Redfin. I can go do that. I can arrange open houses on my own. The lockbox is there. I'll go walk around the property. I don't need someone to point out that the color is nice in a room. And so I think that there's elements of what this hap of what will happen here, which is a fragmentation and then an automation of these services. And as a result, significant fee reduction and I'm in the middle of doing this myself right now with a piece of real estate where okay, I'm not using an there. agent. But there's a lot here, Lisa, I want to unpack. This is something millions of people heard. Okay. So I want to pack from David Freeberg, billionaire. You can tell how intelligent he is just, just listening to him. Um, what stood out to you? I've got about 11 bullet points that stood out to me. W what stood out to you? Uh, I don't even know where to start. So I guess I can start at the end and kind of work my way back. Um, so a lockbox there to access the property, walk alone because he doesn't need anyone to point out the room color. Well, so first, I actually thought that was funny. That was, was that not funny? Not funny. I don't need I don't need someone to point out the room color. That was actually kind of funny. Yeah, right, it was kind of funny. But <laughs> that being said, it, I I think that there's a lot of uh, well, so uh, I, I in that one sentence, I can pull out a bunch, right? Like, here's the deal. I How many companies over the years have tried, I think Zillow maybe even tried this or somebody did, where they thought they could put a, a code on a door and sellers would be okay with strangers walking into their homes, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't see a world where the average seller is going to be comfortable giving out a lockbox code and having a buyer walk, unrepresented, total stranger walking through their home. I see a world where lockboxes become more advanced, where you have to put thumbprint, you know, facial face technology, maybe even a license into the lockbox so that that data is collected. But think about this. If somebody wants that lockbox, they also want what you're talking about, which is the privacy and the security of the showing. So to your point, 
okay, are we in a world where listing agents are there for every showing that becomes more expensive on that side? Or are we in a world where they want the buyer representation coming through the home? But you, you, I just wanted to make those points. You can continue. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a, a, a real big misconception. And again, I'm going to go back to kind of what you said, where he's a very educated, very smart man. He's probably not the typical consumer and definitely not the first time buyer. And he alludes to that because he says most consumers have the majority of their wealth tied up into their house. So this is, he didn't use the word emotional, but he used the word very similar to emotional. It's a very touchy, I think he said, yeah. uh, a very touchy subject, which another way of saying emotional. He probably has less than a half a percent of his wealth tied up into real estate. So he thinks about real estate a lot differently. Yep, a hundred percent. But my point is going to be, if that's what he thinks real estate agents do when they're walking through the home with him, he hasn't been working with the right real estate agents. How many times do you and I, every agent, work with the first time buyer who doesn't know the basics of the systems? They don't know how to understand what is the difference between a crack in the ceiling that's normal settlement versus the cracks in the ceiling that indicate that there's a major structural issue. Um, and just as much as agents can help consumers navigate when it is a bad defect, I think one of the biggest values that agents bring as a buyer agent on the other side is helping consumers understand that it's not that it's not a bad defect, that it's normal, and that it's not something to be scared of. Um, I, I think that there's so much more that an agent does. Okay, so, so, so let me just give you some of my bullet points. Yeah, I um, multi there, but go. <laughs> it's okay. Um, how about the fixed fee? He right, believes well, that the commission time. is. You had that next. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so the fixed fee, and it's interesting. So my quick notes were the numbers that he was throwing down per service, again, are kind of out of whack. I do believe that there might be a model for some agents and that that might work for some consumers, but thinking that it's going to work across the board for all and that um, software or AI or technology can become or replace a trusted advisor that I have trusted advisor in quotations. And thinking that which is a which is a word I think we should all be framing into our marketing because this is what they're look this is what people are looking for as a trusted advisor. He says people want a trusted advisor. He wants a trusted advisor. Now he thinks over time it's going to bleed into AI or software as the trusted advisor. But at the end of the day, he's recognizing that consumers want a trusted advisor. One hundred percent. Yep. Uh, more seamless, more direct uh, in terms of ease of the transaction. We wrote all the same words down. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, the technology side, the direct side are talking points of the plaintiff attorney in the settlement, if we remember correctly. He, he, that was a big part of his shtick. Yep. So it's not, it's not like this is just, it, it, you know, it's not just one person's opinion. This is an opinion that is, is out there. No doubt. No doubt. And it's not, um, he's not, it's not a, a, it's not a minority opinion, right? I wouldn't say it, it's out there enough where it's, it's not a, a solo opinion. Um, I, I do find my other notes. If as I go up, I mean, he said the industry is known to have fixed pricing. I obviously disagree. Hundred billion dollars in revenue will go down by thirty percent. Oh, on the fixed pricing, real quick, this one have data to back it up. All right, educate, don't defend. We just came off of a webinar that we were doing with Tom Ferry and and Jack Miller and um and others, and the chart of showing the Phoenix MLS kind of really shows not only today you can go back in time, and I have pulled the same chart for my MLS where, okay, 60% uh, are choosing this buyer compensation, 20% are choosing that, 5% are choosing this. So just a snapshot on a, on a table shows you that, well, geez, there's not fixed price. When I, Lisa, when I looked at my MLS, I was actually surprised to see how few, he uses the number 6%, 3 and 3. It's kind of the number everybody's just using. There was almost no 3% buyer compensation offers in my MLS. It was, I can pull up the number. It was less than 5%. And I would have thought that that number was like Phoenix was 30%. Can, 
Connecticut MLS was less than 5% offering three. It, it took me back a little bit because I'm like, wow, this has been a true negotiation. Obviously, we agree the whole time, but really that that number has come, come down in comparison to 10 years ago when I was in the business. Yeah, our average across the company, I, I pulled our data uh, earlier. I can't, I haven't been able to get the breakdown per listing. The average year to date in my company, every buy side transaction closed is 2.11%. And it's different in every market. I mean, we looked at Phoenix, it was 29% where it was at three. So to say that there's some fixed out there and, you know, Calcanus, uh, J. Cal, who's, who is the moderator of this pod, he just went right into six and three as if that is happening at a hundred percent across the country. And 2.1 is pretty far off uh, from that. I mean, that's, that's 30%, 33% away from that. So right. what else stood out to you? Well, so it's interesting. I, I disagree with the fact that half of the agents are going to be gone. He said that the interesting part is that the, and where I don't have an opinion yet is the hundred billion dollars of commission revenues will go down by 30%. Um, that's a number that's out there by Consumer Federation. Uh, it's a number that JP Morgan just jumped on, I think, based off of the Consumer Federation of America reporting. Yep. It's probably where they're pulling that number to. Well, no doubt. But I, I guess my point is I I, I believe that we're going to see commission vol uh, the dollar amount of what's actually spent on commission go down. I don't believe it's going to go down by that much. Um I do believe it's going to go down a bit. It'll be interesting to be, see where it shakes shakes out. But I believe thirty percent is a is a bit much. Even if we look on the long term, I don't see that happening. I guess maybe some wild cards five years out. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But that's a big number to think about and to toss out there. Um, I mean, I could see in five years we're in a completely different market if inventory. Well, that's why I said it's a little which, bit hard to predict, right? It's hard to predict because I think market conditions are, are going to have something to do with this. Right now, we see over 100,000 more homes active on the market across the U.S., Northeast being the outlier. But you see right now to, in in the south, south region, like Florida and southeastern region, inclusive of Texas, the south region, you're at 36% more active inventory today than the same time a year ago. The West is about 13%. The Midwest is about, almost about 13% as well. And the Northeast is zero. It's, it's really, you know, unchanged on inventory. That being said, in 12 months from today, I think the Northeast will look like the Midwest and the West where you've got 10 to 15% more active inventory in 12 months. Everybody in the Northeast keeps saying the market won't change. But every time I see the South, the Midwest and the West change historically over time. The Northeast is 12 months to follow. There's some market condition. There's something we don't see and inventory falls. It may not be particular to Boston city, Boston proper, however you like to say it, Lisa, yeah. but I'm just talking Northeast as the whole, you start to get into those suburbs. I got, I'm going on one next week. Uh, these folks bought in 2020, they're New York. They're living in a small little uh, village in Connecticut. Hey, we're, we're kind of done with Connecticut. We, we, we kept the place in Manhattan. We're kind of done here. It was cool. It was fun. Party's over. Uh, we're the last, it's four in the morning. We're the last ones to leave. It's all good, but we're heading back. And so there's going to be an increase in inventory. Um, and in that market, Lisa, there's actually an incentive for, for sellers to get creative. I don't want to be the one sitting on the market. I've got a need. I've got a timeline. Agree. Need is going to come into play at some point. Um, yeah. All right. Those were my notes, but. Okay. So how about the, he let off conspired to inflate. Um, that's something that people are reading. You don't want to defend. Um, obviously part of the settlement, nobody acknowledged a conspiracy. If that comes up, what do you even say? If some, hey, there was this, uh, the way I understand it, Lisa, is there was a conspiracy. Uh, is that, is that what this is about? You know, interesting, I, I've been on a bunch of appointments, both buyer appointments and seller appointments, and I haven't had a consumer say that to me, but I get your point. And I, I think I just go back to everything that we've always said. There's a reason that we go in with blank contracts. Fees have always been negotiable, right? Like I love that line. Write that one down. And, and look, this is a pod I think you want to take notes on. Like I've taken notes here. What Lisa just said, there's a reason contracts are blank. I love that. 
You have some great lines, Lisa. You had one earlier today where you, where you said um, limit on out of pocket expense. No, you said cap yeah, on out of pocket. Yeah, same diff. Cap on out of pocket expenses, which was a brilliant just way to position that. Okay, do you want? Do we want to go with the rest of the all in pod? There's more here, and then before we get into the other one, what what do you have left on this clip? We have I think there's a few minutes left. Quite a few there's quite a few minutes here. Do we want to go to the next one? Do you want to hear what some of the other people on this pod said, Lisa? Yeah, hit me up. Let's go. All right, let's do this one. Um, we've got plenty more reactions, so hit the thumbs up if you're on YouTube, if you like it. Let's keep rolling. Okay, new notes. been using a direct listing service. I've used all of these standard forms. There's a lot of AI tools you can use to kind of read all the disclosures for you, make sure everything's copacetic. And these escrow agents, they'll handle a lot of what a lawyer will handle. And they'll get paid a you know a fee, which is much less than the agent's fee. So I do think that there's a big disruption happening in this industry. I think it's it's really important for consumers. Agents are going to be you know hands in the air telling you this is ridiculous. You need someone to help you. You need an advisor. That will continue for a good chunk of the market for a very long period of time. But I do think that it's for the benefit of consumers over time to see these fees come out of the system and see those savings go back into consumers' pockets and for the value of their real estate to go to go in their pockets, not into an agent's pocket. Is it going to change the This is one of the original founder profitability uh, people at Facebook. of a realtor? Pretty meaningfully, right? Both realtors won't be able to be in business. Right. I think the sellers will do fine and they might capture more of it because they'll they'll my understanding is the 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 seller will maybe do both sides of the transaction. No, that's not what's going to happen and there's also going to be limits on that. But but here's what I will say if you look at the, the, the number of people, there are 1.4 million members of NAR today, the National Association of Realtors. If you look at the distribution of earnings, uh, you guys know this. My guess is probably 10% of those realtors make 40% of the fee income or 50% of the fee income. Some that there's a long principle. tail. Yeah. So there's probably a third of those folks who are already kind of sub-living standards in terms of income. Maybe half of them won't be able to make enough money in this new you know, fee regime that the, it'll no longer be an attractive proposition to be a real estate agent for maybe half a million to a million people over time that are agents today. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. This the, the sellers are going to be faced with buyers who just show up having seen something on Redfin and don't have a buyer's representation. And so they think, from the stuff I've been reading, that the seller's agent might be pointing them to, hey, go to these services and be acting as like one broker, essentially representing both sides. That's what people are saying is the potential yeah. downside. I don't think of that's this. Gonna, Yeah, that's not going to happen for a couple of reasons. But let me ask you guys a question. If you guys wanted to go buy a new house, currently you just go, you know, sign up an agent or buyer's agent and they go walk with you and eventually they'll get paid by the seller's agent. So now you have to negotiate a fee with them up front. Would you negotiate a fee and say to a buyer's agent, hey, I'll pay you 2% of whatever home I buy? Would you be comfortable doing that or 3% or 4%? How would you have that conversation? This is where it gets no, good. Well, you say, Sax. I mean, forget. I know you've got a different situation because you've got real estate people like working for you. But like if you were to go out and get, and if, would you go out and get an agent and pay and negotiate a fee with them? It is not worth it to the buyer to pay 2 to 3% of the purchase price to yep. make appointments. You can see yeah. all the houses on MLS through Zillow or Redfin or whatever. And what about handling closing and disclosures? No buyer would ever voluntarily agree to pay this massive commission. It's not worth it. So it's game over for the realtors if buyers are forced to pay their own broker's commission. The only reason this system works is because the seller is forced to pay for it. Yep. And when you sign the listing agreement with the seller's agent, you can negotiate a little bit at the margins. Sometimes you can get the 6% down to 4 to 5% for a big listing. But 50% of it will always go to the buy side. I mean, I've said to these guys, the buy side agent doesn't do anything. Why don't you make it 2% for yourself or 1% for the buyer? They won't do that. They just won't take your business. The seller will not represent you. They have like all sorts of rules against it. So the, yeah. the whole thing is like protect. It's like a racket that's protected. And somehow. now it's been so, cracked. Yeah. Well, I, I still am like a little bit skeptical that this is going to work out exactly the way we're saying, because it is just such a, a death blow to the industry if buyers are forced to pay their own commissions. 
uh, their own oh, yeah. buy side brokers commission. And in the articles, they're saying there's still like some gray area about what's going to happen, but that is what should happen. Buyers should be responsible for paying their own brokers. And if you do that, I think you'll knock out half the fees of this industry. Here's an idea. Why don't they let them char charge an hourly fee as a buyer's agent? Like you there will pay be people lawyer. doing that, J. Cal. Two hundred dollars sure. an hour, three hundred dollars an hour. Doesn't yeah. this and impact home prices as well? Like if you if the buyer had to pay, all of a sudden their affordability effectively goes down because if they have to pay an extra hundred thousand right. dollars for a home, then that's a hundred thousand dollars they can't pay less than they can pay for the house itself because they have to pay an agent. So but it, it all comes back into home prices, no? It nets out because the seller's agent's no longer paying 6%, they're paying 3%. And so now the seller's agent has 3% more that, right. that, so they, your net, that they'll take your a net's the same. Yeah, but net, net. I think it's good for buyers and sellers because the transaction costs of trading go down. Exactly, yeah. the money goes back in consumers' pockets. Yeah, create a more fluid market. Yeah. And I think it's a great opportunity okay. for start. I think I think we can get off off of this one. We'll, we'll go to the next one here in a minute. But I got a lot of notes there, Lisa. That was a pretty chunky conversation. I think you can appreciate the word choice, chunky. You like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mental images. All right, you, just, you tell me yours first. Well, I mean, I just ran. So we know the number on average a uh, buyer agent works 184 hours with a buyer client from start of process to closing. And if you just take their lower number, cause they threw out two to 300 bucks an hour, I, I'm like, okay, I'll just take the two, forget the three, keep the extra hundred, exactly the number I have 36,800. I guess I know how to multiply. Um, I think almost, I know for sure, if I walk downstairs and I say to my agents, we're going to a new model, I'm gonna pay you guys $200 an hour. You don't have to worry about what the, the team split is. They're gonna say, Hey, here we go. I mean, I'm going to have agents working a hundred hours a week uh, until about the summer. And then they're going to take the whole summer off because they're going to have made so much money. It would have been ridiculous. Um, ridiculous is a word that I wrote down at the beginning. David Freeberg had a quote. He said, agents are going to run around, throw their hands up and say, this is ridiculous. <laughs> that too. <laughs> don't be, don't be that agent. You're a knowledge broker. This is the whole point of this podcast to separate yourself so far away from the agent he just described, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And be calm, be educating, not defended, defending, and be somebody who's knowledgeable. Okay, so we th that's why this pod exists, we get that. Um, a small percentage of agents make all the money, that's how it's always been, and that, that's how, it, the, by the way, the have and the have not disparity is gonna grow wider right now, yeah, because the, the ones that are jumping into this are, are going to help a lot of people and the ones that think this is a lot of hard work it, are not going to are not going to do it he said something here it's a quote um he said you know a lot of people hire what would you he, when he started asking the question to the other people on the pod uh to chamath and, and david Sachs in particular he, he said you know what would you guys do if you went and bought a house you'd hire an agent and they'd quote walk with you so in his perception david freeberg that's what a buyer agent does. They walk with you. They open doors, as we say. What, what's the reaction to that? Yeah, well, my note said uh, that the ask for, a, it was correct, that buyers will not voluntarily agree to pay their broker 2 or 3% to make appointments was my... Same, same type of thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, again, I think that... There By the way, I think we both agree with that. Who the heck would pay two or three percent to just schedule appointments? Yeah, it, and I, I, I've said this before. I think that it is part of not again not agents watching this podcast, but I do think it is part of what we have um, created as an industry with some of what we put out as the the own perception of ourselves. And I think it, I, I've said this over and over: a skilled buyer agent, a true specialist in helping buyers accomplish their goals, is more than just opening the doors and setting the appointments. And I agree wholeheartedly. Um, but I think that there needs to be a real level set on all of the values that a buyer agent brings to the table. Um, you know, finding the opportunities, negotiating the deals. Uh, negotiation, you and I both know, is an art form and a skill, right? And if a buyer agent can help a buyer accomplish their goals, whether, you know, in a market where it's a buyer's market, negotiate a lower price and save money and prove their value through that end. I think the consumer will pay for that. 
the, and they will choose to pay for that through that negotiation, through that disclosure that we are just going to continue to talk about that. When you get in front of a customer, you over disclose everything of how, who, what is going to be paid because they use the word forced to pay. I and so, that. yep. right. That's the feeling out there that's forced to pay. But I just want to know how confused are most of these are very intelligent people who read the Wall Street Journal, who read the time, who read all this stuff, right? And how confused are they? They're like, wait a minute, but uh, you know, it's my understanding that the seller, he's talking about the listing agent when he keeps saying the seller, the seller will do both. They'll just kind of do both. And then for, no, no, that's not how it work. So, th you know, they're not on the same page and they, I don't expect them to be, this isn't their, their field or industry, right. but this is a reminder for all of you listening that you need to have a Loctite explanation take the time to walk it to, has your time just gone up exponentially on getting in front of customers and walking them through this process so that they deeply understand it oh absolutely because there's a lot of confusion out there yeah. and that's why i think the separation between the haves and have nots grows because those that are willing to do it uh, are, are going to get more clients yeah yeah it, it, his point uh one of my other notes was that half the people who are living on that, uh, I don't, I, he was talking so fast, I didn't write the exact word about the subpar income or sub whatever, whatever, that he predicts 500 to a million agents will be out of the business. I, it, again, that stuff is the stuff that kind of makes me sad because I don't agree with it. I think I, ironically, those agents will always exist in the business. Um, deflate prices, but- Well, you'd agree though, that we're at a a high watermark on agent count right now, yeah, right? No yeah, no, I okay. and I've said that very publicly. I think the number that we're looking to lose is not six hundred thousand, definitely not five hundred thousand to a million. I think that there will be some. I think it's a good thing that's what's going to come out of this is a uh, maybe a slight increase in the bar to entry for the industry, make us much more professional. That was my five a.m. call this morning. Uh, yeah, and I'd love that. I'd be a fan of. That. I'd support that. Um, uh, one of his other things was that it will deflate prices, but real estate will maintain values, which I didn't quite fully understand. Um, I, I think what he meant there was it'll deflate the cost for consumers, but the value of the home, it, what he's saying is I think what we all agree with, which has been, a you know, president Biden had this misconception that put the money back into the buyer's pockets. Like, I think what he was saying is more accurate. Like, uh, no, the the price of real estate, the house is not going down. Barbara Corcoran just said this on a on a Yahoo interview recently as well. Like the cost of the home is not going to go down because of this. But what he was saying was he believes the the, the fee cost structure around transacting in his, their okay, opinion would go you. down. I, I follow you. I follow you. Yeah. Here. Okay. Let's go to the Patrick Bet David podcast, right. Lisa. Um, you haven't, we're going to take some more notes here. You you haven't heard this clip either. So you're hearing it for the first time. PBD, his podcast, who, who you see on the screen here, he just exited out of an insurance company for roughly $260, $280 million. Um, he's got a panel of Chris Cuomo. You remember Chris Cuomo from CNN? Yep. Chris Cuomo's on the panel. Um, he's got a guy uh, that worked insurance with him, has a couple teams, think real estate teams, teams of insurance agents. So you've got some insurance people, obviously not Chris Cuomo, he, he's a journalist, but you've got some salespeople on this panel who have made their living on commissions. So we're gonna get a little bit of a different discussion here. Um, let's react to the clip. But again, millions of people hear this one. Yep. Ending 6% commission, Tom, I'm coming to you with this could turn out to be a Venus flytrap situation. Rob, pull up the picture of Venus flytrap. It's very important for us to educate these people who this don't have a clue. Is, this is what a crazy, Venus, how a, do you not know what a Venus flytrap is? Fly. If you've That's ever what seen the movie Little trap Shop of Horrors. Well, like, like, Audrey. Yeah. Like, what kind yeah, of feed me, Demon Demon Demon. Demon. I'm hungry. Ending 6% commission go to the could turn out to be a Venus flytrap situation for home buyers. Mm -hmm. And an economist says, okay. Um, first time I learned what a Venus flytrap was yesterday. The National Association of Realtors <laughs> settlement expected to take effect in mid-July. Pending approval aims to remove upfront display of commissions for buyers, agents on multiple listing service. 
a move that could, that could result in additional costs for home buyers. According to a real estate economist, Ken Johnson, the situation resembles a Venus flytrap where buyers might find themselves at a disadvantage. Johnson cautioned that approaching listing agents directly could leave buyers ill-equipped to secure the best deal going directly to a listing agent who represents a seller in a legal sense, puts the buyer at an extreme disadvantage in terms of bargaining power and market knowledge. With the proposed changes, buyers may need to cover their agents' fee themselves, potentially adding significant expenses to their home purchase. For instance, on a $400,000 house, paying 3% commission to a buyer's agent would translate to an additional $12,000 in cost for the buyer. Tom. What are your thoughts on the story? Well, first of all, this is economist Ken Johnson, who represents the real estate industry. So what yeah. side is he on? They didn't mm -hmm. want the status quo to be up, upset. They didn't want uh, buyers and sellers, uh, excuse me, they didn't want people to be able to negotiate with realtors and say, hey, there's a very nice house. Why don't you do it for 4%? Because there's three guys that want to represent me. Oh, okay, I'll do it 4%. That's the way this is going to work. You know, somebody selling the house has the the control. And what they're saying is if buyers go direct to a listing agent, that's not the way it works. When you want to buy a house, you you will have a buyer's agent that will somebody represent you. And this guy's trying to stoke fear that this law is going to create problems and everything. And so he's representing the industry, but that's not the way it's going to work. Somebody's going to say, hey, Vinny goes and he says, I'm going to go buy that little house. He goes up there. No one's going to say, oh, you're kind of screwed. You're going to have to be paying the fees because the guy selling it's going to go, no, no, no. Chris is going to say, no, no, wait a minute. If Vinny's capable and can buy my house, I'd like to sell him a house because I'd like to have a good buyer come in. I'd like to sell my house. I don't want the listing to be here forever. And so you make a deal and they say, well, we've agreed with, uh, you know, uh, Adam, the realtor. He's going to do it for 4%. We're going to do this. This is basically the industry is scared to death of the power that they're giving the buyers. Is this a good sellers. thing or a bad thing? This is a very good thing because people have been sitting there 6% like is it or it not. Is it a good thing for people like you where you're in the 1% time because you, you could actually be a realtor or is it good for the 80% of buyers? I think this is good for the buyers and sellers who are no longer forced into a 6% arrangement. They can negotiate with the best listing agent they want, find someone they like, and come to agreement on the commission. I disagree with our friend Tom here because um, we're in the insurance business. We've seen what's happened with the DOL laws. I'm actually shocked that our friend Tom, who's been an advocate for the Department of Labor, what's going on in the insurance business, isn't advocating for your real estate friends, Tom. Um, here's the reality. We know if you're selling a $10 million house, $20 million house, they're going to negotiate with you up front. Up front, you know, the 6% is going to get split, three and three, that gets the trickle down effect. But to me, this is the seller trying to save 10 grand, but ends up losing out on 100 grand in the, in the long run. So great. So I have a good friend, Gio, he watches the podcast all the time, my realtor. Um, he says, number one, you just got to be forthright about the commissions. Straight up, this is how it works. This is what's going on. Let's have this conversation up front. Number two, I'm going to bust my ass for you. I'm going to get the best deal possible for you. My job is incredibly hard, incredibly different. I'm going to carry the brunt of paying out the out-of-pocket costs to market your house. And number three, if you want to go about this alone, go for it. Good luck. You're not going to do the best job possible. You're going to get screwed. So um, are there situations that you can negotiate commissions? Sure. But I firmly believe that salespeople in finance, in insurance, in real estate, deserve their commissions and if they don't they're weeded out of the industry anyway yeah i i, I mean tom you, this reminds me of the one realtor that you know we were introduced to from our church in la to sell our last house which i'm sure you remember this story with that smile on your face so she gets introduced to represent our house and i watch her when people come and look at the house and it's I'm, I'm I'm it's driving me insane at this point that this girl doesn't know how to sell this house. Oh no! So finally, I told her, I got a couple people coming to looking at the house today. I don't want you to come. Don't come. <laughs> Just stay home. So she says, "What are you talking about? Everybody wants their agent to be there. I don't want you to be there. But I'll sell for you. You don't need to come." The guy comes. Okay, I sell him the house. I give the tour everything. He makes the biggest offer cash price, you know, cash offer. I call her. I said, it's done. You can handle the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I said, from here, don't talk to the client. Just do the paperwork. You shouldn't be talking to clients. <laughs> You're not a salesperson. We sold the house. She sucked. 
as a realtor, okay? Mm -hmm. So there are certain people who will kind of go back to his point. They absolutely don't do the client, you know, uh, the right amount of mm -hmm. service to sell it because they're just trying to kind of sell it and get a check for them, right? They're not thinking about that additional $100,000. Yeah. It's $2.2 million or whatever the house is. Like, you know, I'll, I'll sell them for this uh, value. Now, some realtors that bust their ass for you, yep. let me tell you, those guys – don't get paid enough money. Some of the guys that do a good job. But, you know, in some instances, it's actually a great idea. In some instances, I can see Tom's argument as well. Because when, if Tom comes to your house, Vinny, yeah. okay, I guarantee you within 20 minutes, this is how Tom is. This is what he does. <laughs> you just lose yeah. Tom. Yeah, 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 yeah. He does one of these He's things. He's going into and Tom, Tom mode. Is in Tom mode. Yeah. He says, you know, for about uh, $220,000 you put into this house, you can probably increase the valuation by a couple million dollars if you did this. And here's what I would do in da 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 Anything he buys, he makes it better. You know that saying, I leave you better than I found that's, you? That real. really is Tom. Yeah. Not just with people, with property as well. Okay. That's how Tom is. So Tom never needs a realtor. Tom literally doesn't need a realtor. For the average person, yes. they need this service. Chris, Tom, when Tom, you come to my house? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tom is not the average dude. <laughs> Tom comes in with paperwork, case studies. This is the guy that doesn't Tom's need a realtor. Tom's father was Vinny. a rocket scientist, exactly. guys. Vinny, listen, when you go to buy your house, take Tom. What do you mean? Or take a realtor. <laughs> already did. Don't I already do did. it yourself, Vinny. I already did. You'll get no, we're screwed gonna, we're gonna to save five grand. Chris, what are your thoughts on this story? Uh, it's always tempting to have variability in a locked-in system, right? There is something unsatisfying about having someone tell you, this is how it works, it's 6%. Yeah. And uh, you want to play with that because you're, you may think, like uh, Pat does, well, one, I'm very competent, or my house sells itself, and you're not even doing anything. You know, everybody in the market right now is dying for this. You should take less. Uh, so there's an appeal to that. Uh, but also things in such a well-worked system as real estate tend to be the way they are because that's the way it works best. Mm. So I think you have a balancing effect here. I, I do wonder, you, you made the point, Pat, in terms of the 1%, the sophisticated people like Tom, but I do wonder if it's about, well, what type of real estate are we talking about? If there are a thousand units that are just like okay. this one and, the, you know, and there's very little work, to get this to sell. You're going to have to put money into print and advertising. You're going to have to work your contacts. You're going to have to do things. But if we're trying to sell your house right now, mm -hmm. I don't know why you'd need a realtor, right? All you have to do is just say on the show that you want to sell it and you'd have like 50 offers the next minute. So I think it's situational. Um, and there are a lot of, to Adam's point, there are already a lot of protections in place when it comes to real estate. So I don't think it's about needing to keep the percentage locked in where it is because that's where everyone's safest. I think it depends on where it is. My, my concern is more with the insurance um, market. Okay. That he's going to get into homeowners insurance there. And yeah, where he's going to go off topic there. Okay. Um, a couple things that stand out every time you have folks that are not in the real estate industry talking about this, you hear forced into 6%. Um, and, and so that like, so it, all cards on the table. Do you think that consumers believe that they are locked into 6%? Like if you were to walk into, I, I, I believe that the consensus out there of consumers who are not transacting default to that because that's the assumption as people get within two weeks of selling, they get really educated really quick on the fact that it's, it's not a locked in 6%. I've never gone into a listing appointment, been on hundreds, if not thousands, where there's an assumption from a seller that it's 6%. That's, um, that's my point. That's what I don't get. Like I uh, look like over the past, like, I don't know what, five years, I hundreds of listing appointments and a seller has never said, I know that I'm going to have to pay you 6%. Where do I sign? Like no, I've, never, I've never heard that. I've never heard that. I've got to be honest. That's never come up. <laughs> um, it's always, you know, they're starting here. I'm starting here. We're trying to figure out a, a customized solution that can, you know, uh, make everybody happy. Okay. So um, I want to go to the story that PBD said about the female agent who he hired to 
list his home when he was moving. He doesn't know how to sell the house. That was his exact quote. Now, let's be, let's break this down. This guy, if you don't know him, PBD is a professional salesperson. No doubt. And he's insanely smart and his books are epic. And what he's done is amazing. No doubt. He's a salesperson. He's probably in the top 0.1% of salespeople in the country on the way he scripts sales and the way he was a recruiter and, and all these different types of things. So, and I've had sellers like you get a salesperson, they want to give you sales advice. You, you, you work for a salesperson, you work for somebody in business, an entrepreneur, they kind of are doing what he's doing. He's sitting there watching. Now here's the point I'll make. I'm not saying she was a, a bad agent or a good agent, but what I would say is I think the specialization of real estate is going to get ramped up a hundred X, not just 10 X where the past four decades. Okay. For the first 10 years of my career, I can work with a lot of buyers. Then those buyers become sellers. Now I'm learning the listing and I become a listing agent. I want listings. I want this. I want that. I want to be well-rounded. I think moving forward, Lisa, we're going to have a real specialization. PBD believes that this agent, he could be completely off. We don't know who she is. Um, is not, should not be dealing with clients, should be p potentially dealing on the back end uh, of the deal in the office or may maybe with buyers, certainly. But he said, you're not a salesperson. Lisa, do real estate agents, because I see a lot of new agents coming into the industry and they don't even like the word sales, yet they're coming into real estate and selling people's homes. Our product is air. Should real estate agents today and every day moving forward Get real comfortable with the idea that being a trusted advisor, being a guide through the process, also comes with having high level salesmanship, saleswomanship. I agree with it. It was my entire 5 a.m. call this morning, right? And it was looking at, I challenge everybody, go Google the top skills for salespeople. 24 of them will come up. I do believe without a doubt that real estate sales is a sales industry. And I, I agree with almost all 24 of the skills that Google lists out and believe that if all people selling real estate engaged in those skills, it would change the industry, change the consumer experience, but also change the way that we work together to have outcomes for our clients. Couldn't agree. Um, I love what they did say. I mean, these guys, sales guys, but um, talking about the 80, the 90% of people and this is similar to, to what we heard in the other pod to maybe a lesser degree than the other pod. Um, but 80% of people are going to need an agent. I mean, they said, Tom, you're in the 1%. You don't need an agent because you're so smart. I'd actually argue that that dude needs an agent. He's a, he's like a um, operator mind. He's not a sales mind. Okay. He's very smart, but you get one of those guys negotiating with emotional home buyers. Um, th there's going to be some friction on those deals uh, and trying to get that deal for us. I'd actually argue that he does need an agent, but the fact that they were acknowledging, Hey, most people are going to need an agent moving forward. And I love what, um, the guy saw said at the end, he goes, sales people, whether it insurance or, or real estate or otherwise should be paid a finance should be paid, a due commission if they've earned it. Yeah. And if not, they're weeded out. I had that same note. Salespeople deserve commission, some other stuff. If not, they're weeded out. Here's another thing. I was talking to Jimmy Mackin after our um, webinar we did with, with TF earlier. And Jimmy's like, hey, when you were working through your scripting, because listen, Knowledge Board, we're working through this every single day. I thought this was this was a fun exercise to really just open up the mind of how you're thinking about your scripting. I, I know Lisa, you're going to, you're going to take these notes and you're going to implement it in your scripting. I'm doing the same thing uh, because these are, these are the feelings that consumers and very smart people have out there. But Jimmy said to me, Hey, something that you said in your scripting, like basically, you know, you're tripping over, you know, pennies to what's that saying, tripping over pennies to um, I'm foolish. I know. I know yeah. That, that. that analogy there. And, and they made it, to pick up dollar, you know, tripping over pennies, pick up or whatever the case may be, you know, and, and sauce said something like this, Hey, you're trying to save $10,000. You're going to lose a hundred thousand yep. dollars. I couldn't agree with that more. You're trying to save two points and you're going to sit there and I mean, you have to go back on the market 
even in a low inventory situation, if you have to go back on the market because you went under contract and you get tripped up on these little negotiations instead of giving the best price first, the best, hey, here's the commission, what it's going to cost you up front. I'm not going to try to renegotiate this deal on the purchase and sale because I figured it out on the front end. You, you got to figure everything out in between and then you lose a buyer. You got to go back on. You get tripped up days on market or you got to go back on. It's a blemish on the listing. I don't care what anybody says. No, but I just had a manager arguing with me about this the other day. No, it's not a blemish. It's not a blemish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a blemish on a listing. You got to come back on the market every time. And if it's a mistake because we didn't work this out ahead of time, it could have been avoided. Um, he also said when he was talking to his agent friend down there in Miami, I mean, he had three bullet points get the commission up front. Yep. I mean, he did it in bro talk, but it makes made sense to me, Lisa. <laughs> co co commission up front. Yep. Number number two, working my butt off. And here's the cost that's in, in relation to my work. Yep. And, and number three, basically, you want to do it alone? Good luck. Yep. And we know, Lisa, going to now uh, a couple of articles that we'll, we'll kind of leave folks with here. We know that the majority of people don't want to do it alone. So we need to educate. But if because if that's the the general uh conception here, I don't want to do it alone. Okay. Well, good news for knowledge brokers. 90% of home buyers have historically opted to work with a real estate agent or broker. That's just on the buying side. 90 plus percent of home buyers have opted for buyer representation. Um, there's an article on Fortune why that's unlikely to change 85 in NAR's recent um, consumer report. This is on now bam.com 85% of all sellers report a high level of service from their agent. So it's easy to jump on the headlines, which some folks will do. And you're seeing that out there um, or to have an opinion. But when the moment becomes yours, your money, as a con your, your money, your decision, your next move um the stakes are higher then and like we said i've really just never heard of a seller assume six percent because when the, when the moment the spotlight's on and it's their time to sell they get real educated real quick and then they become negotiating very quick as they should and um listen i just think as that mo that spotlight gets on them where it's their time to transact once every 12 years um these numbers are going to be reflective 90 percent of people want to work with a home buyer, 90% of people want to work with a, a or a home sell, a, a buying agent, listing agent, and 85% of them um, actually are reporting a high service from that agent. Maybe we can raise that bar to get closer to 99%. I think that's where the opportunity sits. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it comes down to like, uh, they had some of the right points. Those that bust their ass for you don't get paid enough. And I think we just need to keep the... Consumer needs at the forefront, and we will win. And that, by the way, that sounds like an opportunity to me. It, you know, Hello. hey, the ones that are doing it, the knowledge brokers out there, you might not be getting paid enough. You might get a raise. There's an argument um, on that end that there might be a raise due. So, I, th I thought this was a fun exercise. Open up our our mind here to not just being in our own. Um, you know, what do they call that? Uh, when we're just repeating the same thing here in, in our own uh, echo chamber. Thank you, Bobby, because I know Lisa's ADD is kicking in. She's off to something else now. Uh, that our own echo, our own echo chamber. Hey, what are people, really smart people with millions of people listening to them saying about this? Now, how can we take our pages of notes that we've got? and start putting that into script every time i get an extra hour right now i'm looking at my scripts i'm i'm looking at my, the information of how i can relay this in an easy way for consumers to understand as i'm presenting it because the conversations are changing the end goal the transaction making getting people what they want for their home and the timeline and getting buyers into a home that hasn't changed the path to get there has a little bit and so i want to make sure i've got the best information possible i think which includes talking to a lot of consumers about what they're hearing. How do they understand it? Okay, great. Got it. See where you're coming from. That's a good point. Um, and, and I think I should reflect that in the way that I present to you and try to edge and try to help educate you throughout this process. Um, Tom missed a good one, Lisa. Wow. He always misses the good ones, which I might argue might be causation and correlation. Like <laughs> Exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. All right. Have a good weekend, Lisa. When's the when's the uh, playoff start for the Celtics? I gotta I gotta get those tickets. Yeah, yeah, those, you those know, I have to admit, I, I don't, I've been so like. My head has been not buried in the sand, but buried. Oh, you don't want me to get the tickets then? Oh, no, we're going. And you don't want. That's what I, heard. I, I don't think she wants the tickets. Oh, She's I too busy for the. No, I, I don't think you have time for the game. Oh, I, I, I do. I assure you. I, I, I got I got you. Yeah. You got me or I got you. I thought I was. <laughs> who's got. <laughs> All right, Lisa, see right, We know that in 2024, your business operations will be more important than ever. Once I figured this out, my business was able to scale and take off. See, generating leads is one thing, but getting that deal across the finish line while keeping everyone happy is another story. Enter Mosaic. Everything you need, once a lead becomes a client, Mosaic picks up where CRMs leave off to streamline the client experience and maximize your productivity. It's the operating platform that gives agents and teams everything they need to stay organized and proactive throughout the entire transaction process and beyond. Transaction management, forms, AI-powered collaborative search, client retention capabilities, and advanced analytics for your business. In other words, you can use Mosaic to create a powerful flywheel for your business. It will help you close every deal boost your profitability, and generate more repeat and referral business. If you need a better way to run your business, check out the link below and learn how Mosaic can help you today. Since April, we have uploaded new and sought after courses, content, and tactical assets for your business into the BAMX platform, not articles behind a paywall that only pontificate to you what you should think and do, but education that actually shows you how to do what you need in today's market. Every day, we continue to add more content into BAMX and our private Facebook community, content that works, content that our members have exclusive access to daily. It's why over 1,500 of you and climbing have joined us in BAMX. It's also why tomorrow's price is guaranteed to be higher than today's. That's called inflation. Do not wait any longer. Use code Knowledge Brokers and join the thousands of agents taking their business to the next level today. Code Knowledge Brokers for 10% off. See you in BAMX.